Okay, welcome to the stud rail design lecture. This one's really important. This one is, uh, I mean, stud rails have changed the world of post tensioning. We got rid of all the caps, and uh, you know, stud rails now allow us to design really any building and have a flat soffit. So, really important. Um, I also believe that this is the only complete design example, and I mean complete, because there are design examples out there, uh, but I found them to be incomplete. To, to create and really learn uh, stud rail design, I had to grab from a number of different sources to put together my book and my examples. So I've done my best to clarify it. I strongly believe that the people who put together their partial examples didn't really want <laughs> to show you a hundred percent of how it's done because they are selling software and they are selling a product so they want to show you most of it but anyway that's just my personal opinion now what i'm showing you on the screen right now is my discussion from my book about punching shear i'm assuming that you've gotten to this point that you've read this um, either through the last lecture of uh, the third part of the two-way slab design example or that you've read through this or you're familiar with punching shear. If not, uh, I would go through this starting on page 130 in our book. Familiarize yourself with the unbalanced moment at the columns. Familiarize yourself with the portion, the fraction of unbalanced moments transferred by shear stress. You know this I've gone through this in previous lectures so I want to make sure you're you're up to speed here's the properties for an interior column edge column corner column circular columns so an allowable punching shear stresses so I, I am assuming you're with me up to that point so here's the example that we are going to go through Okay. Now I took this actually from a PT data run, so some of the numbers you know, look a little exact. <laughs> I'm trying to remember exactly how I came up with this example, truth be told. Um, I've got a 14 by 16 column, which is not a large column, but very typical, very typical in our, our projects. A slab thickness of eight inches, also very typical. Um, I don't exactly, as I sit here today, remember why I decided 4,500 was the stress, the compressive stress that I wanted to use in the example. I vaguely remember starting with 5,000 and not liking something about it and not making the point I wanted to make, so I changed to 4,500. It's completely lost on me now why I did that. Okay, and like I said, I, I'm matching some PT data examples that I had done, so that's why we're looking at shears of 148.77, you know, not, not a little bit rounder numbers. But. So, okay, 14 by 16 column, bending about the x-axis. We are first going to, before we get to the stud rails, we're first going to check whether or not we need stud rails. And then we're also going to check that we don't have such a high shear stress that we're not allowed to use stud rails. So we have to be in the sweet zone. We have to need them, but the demand can't be so high that we're no longer allowed to use them. So determine the maximum punching shear stresses in critical section one. That's what you would get. That's similar to what we did. Well, it's the same that what we did in the last lecture, if you're following chronologically. And then we're going to do the shear stud design per ACI 318, but there's a caveat there. Um, I'll get to that when I get to that, but it's not really per ACI 318. I'll leave you hanging. Okay. The critical section, if you recall, is the column dimension with D over 2 didn't look pretty off of each edge so 
This dimension is the C2 dimension plus D. This dimension is the C1 dimension plus D. Calculate the perimeter dimension. Calculate the area by multiplying the perimeter by the depth. And for an eight inch slab, we're using a D of 6.5 inches. And an X value of 11.25. Now, this is very similar. What we're doing, remember, is a three dimensional stress analysis, not, not a two dimensional. So where you would have MC over I, if you were looking at a regular beam section, this is the same concept, but um, we're going to look at M, X over J. So, From previous lectures and in the book, this is what the three-dimensional torsional moment of inertia is calculated for an interior column, 47,098.6. And just recall what we're doing. We're, we're bending about this axis. If it was two-dimensional, this would be C, but we call it X in the three-dimensional case. And much as we do typically in, in post-tension concrete or, or any time we have direct shear forces or direct axial forces and bending forces in combination, we separate those. So we are going to look at a direct shear of VU over the area of shear stress. And then we're going to look at the bending shear, the portion proportioned just to the shear stresses. Remember, the unbalanced moment is resisted by two mechanisms. One is the shear stress in the slab surrounding the column, and the other is by flexure and, and flexural reinforcement. So the code tells us we're only responsible in the shear stress check to calculate the portion of unbalanced moment uh, assigned to shear. So, and we will have that portion of unbalanced moment multiplied by the x distance divided by j. Looks like mc over i, but it's three dimensional. Okay. So, as we did previously, we're looking at this gamma factor, which is based on the proportions of the critical punching shear area. C1 plus D is in the direction of the analysis. C2 plus D is perpendicular to the direction of analysis. We crunch all this stuff together, and it says 41.1% of the unbalanced moment must be used in the shear trip stress check. Okay, so our unbalanced moment total was 26.59. The shear stress is responsible for resisting 10.93 foot kips of that. So the maximum shear stress for the critical section one is the VU over the area plus the unbalanced moment proportioned to the shear only multiplied by C divided by J, 297 PSI. Sorry, I had to look at something. The allowable shear stress for critical section number one. Remember, we, we've actually gone through this before. There's two equations written in the code, but in reality, one of the equations says this, and the other one just has this replaced by 3.5. That wasn't pretty. And so the bottom line is you're just checking this equation, but this portion of it can't be taken greater than 3.5. So. And also, strangely enough, F prime C cannot be taken greater than 4,900 in this. I think a lot of people <laughs> don't understand that or get that wrong in their calculations. So 
when you do your calculations for 5,000 psi concrete, it comes out a little off, and it's it's a strange thing. But that's why. Code was written a long time ago, and it hasn't really kept up, in my humble opinion. Okay, and we will take this portion equal to zero. So, portion inside that parentheses is calculated in this case to be 4.52. We are limited to 3.5, so the allowable shear stress equation is right here. The allowable shear stress is 210 PSI, substantially less than the 297 PSI that we have. And this is very typical. Remember, we're post-tension slabs, so we're going longer distances, we can hold up a little more load, and we're doing it with th thinner members. So not at all unusual that we are going to need to provide something, stud rails, shear caps. Uh, we have punching shear problems in post-tensioning. It is our number one problem that you need to be concerned about. So since this is the case, additional shear capacity must be provided. Okay, remember I told you we're doing this according to 318, but not really 318? Well, here's, here's what I mean. Actual ACI 318 is very generic, and it says when you're using headed shear studs uh, VC, the portion just attributed to the concrete, shall not exceed three square root F prime C. And the total VN, which the concrete plus the steel reinforcing, shall not exceed eight square root F prime C. Okay. However, whenever we provide a product like shear studs, it needs an ICC ESR report. Every city that I'm aware of is gonna say, show me the report. You can't just do the calculations based on this on your own. You're providing a product, that product must, uh, your design must satisfy the product ESR report and that product must have one. What every single report that I've ever read for stud rails says, you can't use what the code says. You are restricted to the concrete portion being 1.5 square root F prime C, not three. So you get a 1.5 square root F prime, prime C reduction in these ICC reports. And then it has a strange statement. It doesn't specifically say that VN can't be eight square root F prime C, but it says you must modify the other capacities accordingly or something like that. It's, and that's where the big debate comes in. I've run into a number of engineers that, that read that to say, yeah, well, I understand three square root F prime C goes to 1.5, but I'm still gonna use the eight as the maximum. The statement in the, in the ESR reports clearly states that you must adjust all the values. Now, I wish it just came right out and said 6.5 square root F prime C. I don't know why it doesn't, but it doesn't. But our software, our designs, we make sure that we have adjusted everything for that loss of 1.5 square root F prime C. So that takes eight down to 6.5. That's how our software works. That's how this example is going to work. That's how our designs work. So if you use stud rails and you're satisfying the ICC ESR reports, maximum capacity concrete plus stud rails cannot exceed 6.5 square root of prime C. Okay, what is that with a fee factor applied to it for us? That's 327 PSI. Now our demand was 297 PSI. So we are less than the absolute maximum. So this works, we are, we are allowed, I mean, what I mean by that is we are allowed to use shear studs. If this number were larger than this number, we'd have no choice really but to use column caps. And now we have to start beefing up the cap around the column and everybody hates that. Okay, so remember I'm running along with PT data. I'm actually using a, a real example from a real design 
that we had done. And that's why our, our values were so specific. But I want to show you that I calculated 297 PSI as the worst case. Voila, 297. I agree with PT data, and PT data and I typically agree with each other. We like each other. We're of the same mind. By the way, remember that, I think I forgot to mention this, but there is a plus and a minus to this. If you go back here, this is the plus side where both of the bending shear and the direct shear are additive. Where you have the direct shear subtractive is when is the other face of the column. So that's what you're seeing here. That's the subtractive side. So it's not the one that we care about, but actually ironically also doesn't work. But um, by the way, the red in all this is PT data data telling you you have a problem. <laughs> you don't want to see red in, when you're using our program. So, um, like I said, not unusual though. You typically will. It's just going to tell you you got to do something. And the allowable of 210 for that interior joint So we're matching PT data exactly for allowable shear stress and demand shear stress in this particular case. Now to the exciting part, to the shear stud design. Okay. ACI says that if you're going to use shear studs, um, headed shear studs. The spacing of the rails shall not exceed two times D. So center line, they can't exceed 13 inches. Well, we've got a 14 inch column in one direction. So doing some simple calculations, subtracting the 1.25 width of the rail, dividing by the maximum spacing and adding one. We need two rails on the 14 inch face to satisfy that requirement of the code. On the 16 inch face, we do the same calculations. It turns out we can't get away with just two. We need three rails on the 16 inch face. So the total number of rails will be 10 rails. And here's what it looks like. So this is going to be the answer. We haven't gotten there yet, calculation wise, but this is what the answer is going to be. On the 16 inch face, three rails. On the 14 inch face, two rails, total of 10. Okay, we're gonna end up coming back to this picture in a minute. So, code also talks about stud spacing uh, on the rails. And I don't know if it's confusing or not, the first stud's not to exceed D over 2, 0.5D. Um, the remaining spacing for pre-stressed concrete slabs says you can go up to 0.75D, this is for pre-stressed concrete slabs. Um, Non-pre-stressed concrete slabs with this limitation is reduced to 0.5D. Basically what I'm getting at is it doesn't matter. Pre-stress, non-pre-stress, I don't understand why the change. We're just ignoring the fact that the code says in some instances you can go to 0.75D in the spacing. We're just going to space the first stud at 0.5D and stay, space all the rest of them at 0.5D. That's the way I wrote the software. Um, to me, that's just clearer. So 0.5D, or D over 2, is 3.25 inches for this particular example, for an 8-inch slab with a 6.5 inch D. The overall height of the stud, not all that complicated. Um, really, it's just the cover on the top and the cover on the bottom. It's the slab minus those two. So back to this. 
Um, we're gonna have a one inch cover top and bottom just like we do to the post tensioning just like we do to the rebar okay not complicated so here's how we design the studs gets a little interesting here um, remember we are going with the ESR reports because I don't think you can find one an assembly that allows you to use the full ACI value of 3 so we have 1.5 square root F prime C as the concrete contribution to the shear stress so we're allowed to use 100.6 PSI so let's figure out what's left what do we need the studs to do we have a total demand of 297 PSI, a fee factor of 0.75, and the concrete gives us 100.6 PSI. Therefore, we are left with a, the studs themselves needing to provide 295.4 PSI. Now, this gets interesting because if you think about the shear stress distribution, it's maximum on one face, it's triangularly um, from the flexural part being reduced along the side faces and then it's actually subtracting from the other face but we and every other software program that I use to verify mine just use a constant value of that worst case on all four sides so I think that makes sense it's uh, certainly calculation wise the easiest thing to do you can have moment reversal you know you can have no moment Anyway, I think that's that's the conservative thing to do. Place that maximum value on all four sides of the perimeter and calculate the studs that you need. I mean, whether or not you're even doing that, you, you're calculating the studs you need effectively on one face, and you'd get the same answer if you just kept looking at each face individually. Um, I mean, if you put the maximum stress on. I don't know, I may have just confused everybody, but that's what we're doing, that's how I wrote the software, that's how every example I've seen does it. So we're looking at the AV required, and here is the equation for the shear uh, area of shear steel. So remember, we just manipulated AVFY to be the spacing times the perimeter times VS required, and that must be greater than 2 squared F prime C perimeter of the critical shear plane spacing divided by FY. So let's just back up and see what we're doing. I think this gets complicated in words, easy in pictures. We are calculating we are assuming a shear plane off the face of the column that looks like that. Remember, our critical shear plane is at D over 2 from the face of the column. So really, and if I did this in plan, and we've got this going on on all four faces, So follow me here. All we're really calculating are these, the area of these studs. None of the other studs that you'd see. This calculation to determine the studs, the area required, is just based on the very first stud you're going to run into. This is the magic stud. That's going to determine the, the shear stud uh, neck, you know, diameter, uh, that's either going to work or not work and then bust or, or make the whole design work or not. Then we're just going to keep adding those up at the maximum spacing until we hit the point way out here 
that we have met the allowable shear stress. So I'll get there in a minute, but just to be very clear, the calculations we're doing right now are based on 10 studs, not all the studs that you see. That's what this AV required is. It's just those first studs off the inside face. So we need, we have a spacing of 3.25. We had that critical shear plane one area, um, perimeter of 86 inches. We decided we needed 295.4 PSI in the shear stud, in the steel. Turns out all of these studs have a, a yield of 51,000 PSI. So we need 1.62 square inches when we add up all the first studs off the face of the column all the way around. And that has to be greater than this equation. And it's greater. 1.62 is greater than this. This one's not governing. So, okay. 1.62 is the answer. We will try 3 8 inch studs. Let's start off with the smaller, smallest studs that we use. Um, 1, uh, 0.11 square inches per stud. We had 10 rails with one stud, that first stud in at 0.11 square inches per rail. That only gives us 1.1 square inches. And you'll see that when I run the program that trying 3 8 inch studs is going to tell, it's the program's going to tell us that doesn't work. This is the calculation that it's doing to tell you it doesn't work. You're not close. You need 1.62 square inches. Those 10 studs only gave you 1.1. Even though we have a lot more studs, they're running all out there. The only one that matters was the first one. So we're going to go to half inch diameter studs. So if I do that same calculation, 10 rails, half inch diameter studs is 0.196 square inches of steel. Now I've got more than I need. So we are going to use 10 rails with half inch diameter studs at three and a half inches on center spacing. But just want you to be 100% clear. I don't know if this is always that clear when you use other people's software and the producer's supplier's software. All you did was calculate these studs. So the next question is, why do we have all these studs? Well, that's what we're going to determine next. So the length of the rail. Now, you might think, and you would not be correct, but it would sure make sense, that we were just going to keep adding studs, moving out, creating a larger critical shear plane until that cr critical shear plane stress exceeded the capacity that we already calculated. That would make too much sense. <laughs> There's a reason we don't do that. Um, what the code says, and I've got a lot of opinions on this, is that we now have to extend studs out with that spacing of D over 2 until our critical shear plane in this much larger section doesn't exceed 2 square root F prime C. Now, let's be careful as we're thinking about this because Way back here, we got to use the equation of 3.5 square root F prime C here plus 0.3 FPC. So we're greater than 3.5 square root F prime C. And that's what we end up, end up using. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what 210 PSI is in terms of square root F prime C, but that would be an easy calculation. But it's more than 3.5, I know that, by this much. So. Interestingly enough, when we get back here, oops, our end shear stress can't be greater than two. It seems like a strange punishment. Did something happen to the concrete as it got farther away from the column such that it, its capacity went from 
you know, almost four square root f prime c down to half of that? Did that really happen? I don't think so, but I'll talk a little bit more about that when we finish the design. So what my software does and what everybody else's software does at this point is just add studs, calculates a, shear, a, a critical shear section, determines what stress that shear section has on it as a maximum, and keeps doing that, keeps adding a stud and making it larger until you're less than two square root of prime C. So that's what we're gonna do, that's what my software does, and it says nine studs are required to get to that point. So, of course I ran the software, I know the answer. That's what I'm gonna actually ask you to do. You're not gonna to have to keep adding a stud and recalculating another area and another area and another area. You'll get to use the software too, but, but that's how it got there. It's now saying that we've calculated this critical shear plane way out here, and we're gonna talk about how to generate this in a second. But the maximum stress on this face is now um, limited to two squared F prime C, and that determined how far we had to keep going with these shear studs. Okay, so how do you calculate that? Well, we're gonna do it mathematically down here, but I'm gonna try to explain to you what, what's really happening, and hopefully this life gets easier. If you wanna verify, we're gonna do these, these numbers and there's gonna be a tangent involved and everybody gets scared of a tangent and stuff like that. It's okay, shouldn't be too scary. What we're doing to calculate this critical shear plane. And by the way, it, it appears that it's, it's skimming the edge of these rails and that I've drawn it that way. That's just a coincidence. Please don't think that those two necessarily have anything to do with each other. They're at the same point because I just kept the spacing and I extended the rail another D over two to this point. But that's just a coincidence. And then also notice that where these are meeting up, a little bit of a geometric issue here. So how did I get to this critical shear section? What I do, what you're gonna do, take the very last stud, center line of it. Yeah, it's not a great line. I'm gonna draw a good line. Do this in AutoCAD, I suggest. Get out your AutoCAD and build this. Build this 14, 14 by 16 column, put on these rails with this being 3.25, or whatever it is I've given you in your, your homework. Um, and connect the center line of all the outside, the last studs. in AutoCAD, because AutoCAD's great. Okay, so you, you establish those lines. Now the next thing you're doing is offsetting that D over two. So use the offset in AutoCAD, offset these lines, D over two all the way around. What'll happen is you'll offset to here, you're gonna offset to here, and then you have to fill it that and use AutoCAD's fill it command to just fill it those two. Keep this one going at its angle, keep this one going at this angle and where they meet will be a point somewhere off of that rail. And that's how you will calculate the length of that segment the length of that segment, the length of that segment, and the same there. 
Now mathematically, we don't have to use AutoCAD. We could do this, look at LX1. That's calculated by the width of the column, minus 1.25, which is the total width of one of these rails. We're doing center line to center line. So it's the 14 minus the total width, half on one side, half on the other, plus D times the tangent of 22.5. Now I'll let you figure out why that works. But, um, I had to rack my brain for all that. That's correct. Easiest way to prove it, do what I said in AutoCAD, draw these lines, offset them D over two, and fill it, those, and then measure that. Okay, LX2, the 14 inch columns, plus we have 10 spaces of 3.25 inches. So 10 spaces, two sides, it's happening over here too. Times that space gives 79 inches. And we do the same for the LY1, same idea, and the LY2. So if I'm you and I've asked you to do this, I'm pulling out AutoCAD. But I say this isn't difficult math, but verifying that you did it right is important. Um, one other thing to be careful about when you're doing these calculations, if you start using larger studs, the width of the rail is not 1.25 inches anymore. I think it goes up to one and a half. So you have to be careful um, when you start uh, if you're going to use larger studs and you want to do these calculations by hand. So I try to give you uh, half inch diameter studs in the designs that I give you, but if I didn't, that would, that would explain why you're not getting exactly the same answers. Okay, so we, we've come up with this. We can calculate the new critical section two area, much larger than critical section one was. Two hundred forty-five point five inches, and the area we just take that, multiply it by d, and we get the punching shear area about that. Now, I had to do some research on this next part. ACI four twenty-one one uh, had a statement in there that the polar moments of inertia can be used by doing what I'm going to do, looking at the individual segments. And this is, according to them, an approximation. Um, I think back when I was really researching this, I was more on top of it. And I confess, once I've written software and I verified it works, I start the forgetting process right away of everything that I did. Um, this is close enough for government work and also I was able to verify that I think everybody else who's writing software and, and giving it away with their product is doing the exact same calcs because I checked mine with at least two if not three other software programs for shear stud design and I got exactly the same polar moment of inertia. So, And this is a lot easier than the technical exact way to do it, if I recall. And you're going to like it. So polar moment of inertia, D times the summation of each one of those segments divided by 3. Nobody knows why. It's left end value Y, left end, right end, and right end. Left end squared, left times right, right end squared. You'll see how to use this in a second. 
And the polar moment of inertia about the opposite direction is exactly the same thing, going the other way. So, what are we doing here? This is, this is probably the only hard part about this whole assignment that I'm giving you. Um, segment one, okay, we're gonna add up, the nice thing is we're, we're able to calculate the contribution of each one of these segments. Segment one, segment two, Segment three, we're going to calculate them each individually, and then we get to add everything up. Pretty easy. Segment one occurs twice. It occurs here, and it occurs here. So that's why there's a two. D of the slab. We had already determined that this length of this segment was 15.44 inches, and because ACI 421 says 2, we divide that by 3. The I Y location is 40.5 inches. So that's the I squared. Remember this equation. Y sub I squared. J for that segment is also at 40.5. So yi times yj, they're both 40.5, plus yj. yj is 40.5. Everything's 40.5 in this segment and this segment. Remember that 40.5 is the distance from the centroid of the entire section. So Taking care of segment ones, the two of them. Okay, that was pretty easy. 329,231. Let's look at segment two. Segment two is this, and it occurs four times. It's there, 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 and there. Okay, so that's the four times D We'd already calculated that the length of that segment, interestingly enough, in any one of these directions, was 44.94 inches. Didn't matter that this had two and this had three. Okay. The YI location is 8.72. So the I end of this, or left, if you want to call it that, is 8.72 from the centroid. The J end of that segment, which is right there, is 40.5 inches from the centroid. So yi, yi, yj, sorry, i, yi, yj, and then yj squared. So yj squared is that point, 40.5 squared. So that gives us a major contribution to this torsional moment, or a polar moment of inertia. 806.009. Segment three is this little one right there. And I just broke this up because I mean, you're measuring everything from this point. So the I portion of that segment, the YI is zero. It's at the same location as the centroid. So Y sub I is zero. Y sub J, the other end of that same segment, is at 8.72. And J squared is 8.72 squared. So that doesn't give a heck of a lot of contribution to this, but we'll take whatever we can get. So that's it. That, that explains, that sums all of these, all of the perimeter of the critical uh, shear plane number two.
So those all add up to 1,140,986 square inches. Now if I had moment around the other in this direction, about this axis, I would calculate the moment of inertia going this way. But for this example, we're only looking at this being the direction of analysis and this being the only one that has moment on it, unbalanced moment. So just like we did before, we have to determine what portion of that unbalanced moment in that direction is required to be resisted by shear. So it's, it's the same equation, we just have different shear planes now. But now this is Ly2 over Lx2. Ly2 over Lx2. So we're only required to account for 40% of the unbalanced moment in our shear stress calculations. So that unbalanced moment times 40.3% says that I've got to assume 10.72 foot kips of the unbalanced moment is creating shear stress. Okay, so the maximum shear stress that we have, remember we have the direct shear, the VU over the total area of critical shear plane number two, plus the bending, and it's always going to make sense to do the plus because we're not the subtracting one, it's not going to be the critical one. So we had that unbalanced moment in inch kips multiplied by. Remember, this is the distance from the centroid of the section to the extreme edge that we're interested in. So that was 40.5 inches. Hopefully you remember that. Divided by that whole torsional moment of inertia that we calculated and we get 98 PSI. Okay. The allowable shear stress, remember, it's not what we calculated it to be before. Before we calculated 210 PSI um, allowable shear stress. Strangely enough, the code has said now out at the edge of this new shear plane, we don't get that anymore. Even though it's the same concrete, it's pre-stressed, it's got the same P over A, everything about that concrete's the same, the code has whacked it in half. So it says you only get to use 2 square root F prime C and if I do that I get 101 PSI. So we have created a shear plane that only has 98 PSI shear stress in it. 2 square root F prime C times V is 101. Okay, we're, we're good. And that's what the program did. It kept adding the studs, creating a larger shear plane 2 until this criteria was met. So the final design is we have 10 rails with nine half inch diameter studs at three and a half inches on center. Um, by the way, you know, we're, we're allowed again at the edge of this new shear plane only 101 PSI, but before we had 210. So we are literally allowed less than half of what we had when we were just looking at the first critical shear plane when this is pre-stressed concrete and we didn't have any shear studs. You ask why is that? Well the answer is, and, and this, this makes sense, but you really have to think about it. If you did this calculation and you were still allowed the 210 PSI as an allowable, you'd probably only put on these little tiny shear studs and get out to about this point and you'd be done. And that would look silly. <laughs> Code wants you to go way out here. Wants you to provide substantial rail all the way out to there. There really is no justification for that other than somebody wants that. Now I don't know what would happen if you just came in and you just put in a little tiny length of shear stud off each face, got to a, a shear plane you know that, that looked something like this, and you calculated being less than the 210, and you call it good. 
this is fine. I mean, I like th this looks right to me. You know, that would to to just have a couple of studs, you know, provide a rail that only looks like this without the rest of this. I think would look silly. But the problem with this is it leads you to believe you need to be all the way out here or you're going to fail concrete. Now that I just don't believe. Um, and you got to be careful. I mean, if you, if you were one stud shy, somebody made a mistake, you put eight studs on, um, you could pretty easily do a calculation and show that your shear stress is still way below the 210 PSI. You may not be below the two square root F prime C, but um, before we tell everybody to evacuate the building and run out because their lives are in danger, I don't know if we, you know, that would really be necessary. So there's something with the code. I, I think, and nobody cares what I think, but I think they should just say, you know, do that first calculation. Remember, the only calculation we ever did on the studs was on the very first stud going in. That was it. Our area of stud was based upon these 10 studs. There was never another calculation that calculated the area of any of all the other studs that we did. It just got us out to a shear plane of concrete only. Um, I would like to see the code say, you know, calculate, do that same calculation that we did, figure out the stud size that you need, and then extend that, I don't know, three times the slab thickness, four times the slab thickness, pick any number you'd like. Seems like it should be related to the slab thickness. Wouldn't be a bad idea. But at, at least, you know, you wouldn't leave with the false impression that you're going to actually fail way out here at some extremely low value of shear stress. So this is what it looks like in real life. And I want to show you also now what our software program looks like. So I have modeled this exact same thing. And by the way, I give you an option of using the code and getting yourself in trouble or using the ESR reports. Um, eight inch slab, six and a half inch. Like I said, I don't really remember why I decided to go with 4,500, but I did. We're gonna start out with that 3 8 inch stud diameter, see if that works. I've put in all the values, the 14 inch by 16 inch, 26.59 foot kips of um, unbalanced moment. That's the total unbalanced moment, not the percent that goes into the shear stress. The program will calculate that. And a VU, a total, vertical shear of 148.77. So now when I hit calc calculate, it tells me that we didn't have enough stud capacity. And that's that's what the calculation that we did. It said that 3 8 inch studs doesn't provide enough area of steel in that first line of studs to work. So we're in agreement. I move up to a half inch diameter stud and I get 10 rails, nine rails per stud, three and a quarter inch spacing. So this is what I'm asking you to do in your assignment and your project. Um, so when I look at the text part of the output, you don't need to come to me and see if you've got the same thing. This should show up also in your PT data, but the perimeter I don't know how much of this is in PT data, but the, the area you've calculated, the, the X value from the centroid to the, to the far face, your original, remember this is critical section one, um, your original torsional moment of inertia about the X axis, that, that gamma V, the portion that you need to, you're required to take in shear stress, um, the percent of the unbalanced moment necessary for the shear stress calculation. And that was what we calculated. We calculated 297 PSI and we calculated only having a capacity of 210. Um, the 6.5 square root F prime C maximum is 327 KSI, so, or PSI. 
So that was the critical section one. Critical section two, you know, was was that bigger, bigger one? Um, these were all the values. So the program's doing it. You can see if you're right. It's your total perimeter, total area. Um, there's that torsional moment of inertia. I think I calculated. Um, hmm. One million one hundred forty nine eighty six. One million one hundred forty one one oh three. Close enough for government work. Program, you know, uses more decimals than I did. But um, that that same calculation of the shear stress of ninety eight psi and the allowable of one oh one. So so there it is. That's uh that's shear stead design and, and my opinions of it. I don't think I had anything else. But that's a clean, uh, you're not looking at what I'm looking at. You know, that's a clean looking design and um, uh, works well within the post tensioning. By the way, a little secret with these shear studs, the top cover to the shear stud is one inch, the top cover so the post tensioning is one inch and the top cover to the rebar is one inch. So when you go out there, you don't need a tape measure. You just look right along this line. The post tensioning may be starting to come down, but you look right there. Everything should be in the same plane. The top, the head of the shear stud, the very top of the post tensioning, and the top of the rebar. And if any of those is higher or lower than the others, Tell the contractor, get out your tape measure. One of those isn't right. And they'll swear to you that it's right until they measure and it's not right. The beauty of these stud rails is they're manufactured perfectly, typically. So they are exactly the one inch cover to the bottom and the one inch cover to the top. So they're great at showing you if the rebar is in the right direction or in, at the right location. Now in this direction, the rebar has to be underneath this rebar. So we, we expect it to be a little bit lower, but um, anyway, I like stud rails for multiple reasons, but um, one of them is it helps me tell if the PT and the rebar is actually at the right location. Okay, thank you very much. That actually ends our entire course, so I appreciate you taking the course.